Coming up next on Tech News Weekly, it's me, Jason Howell, my co-host, Micah Sargent, and some awesome topics. We talk a little bit about how tricksters, hackers, whatever you want to call them, are fooling facial recognition systems. Also, did you know that you can apply for jobs with TikTok resumes? Yeah, we, we show you uh, like who that's actually working for. It's working for some people. Also, Google sued uh, for lack of choice with the Play Store. And finally, Ubisoft's big online plans for Assassin's Creed. All that and so much more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 191, recorded Thursday, July 8th, 2021. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack, but when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, their matching technology finds qualified candidates for you and then invites them to apply. So, while other companies give you too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you the needle in the haystack. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNW. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm the other one, Jason Howell. Good to see you, Micah. Thank you so much for covering for me last week. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Ant was here. Uh, we had a good yes. time and uh, glad you're back. Yeah, it's good to be back. And so let's start uh, with a topic that we've been hearing, especially in the last couple of years, although face, facial recognition is nothing new, but it really just seems to be intensifying the, the way the companies are using and relying on facial recognition. And on the flip side, the way people who want to thwart facial recognition systems are actually doing so. Um, things have evolved all around. So we have uh, Parmi Olson from Wall Street Journal here uh, who wrote about how criminals are doing their best to fool these systems. And uh, she's here with us now, Parmi. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You bet. It's great to get you back on. We appreciate it. So um, I know that I've used facial recognition from time to time. I mean, in my own personal experience, and I imagine for most people, the situation that, that comes to mind is with our phones, right? Uh, in order to gain yeah. access to my Pixel 4 XL, there's facial recognition. Apple has their uh, their face ID. Um but how prevalent is the use of facial recognition for security online? Like if we were to set the stage for where we're at right now versus where we were at even a couple of years ago, how much have things changed as far as reliance on these systems right now? Well, it's definitely grown a significant amount. Um, face ID on the Apple's iPhone has really, I think, popularized it in um for mainstream use, a lot of people use that. Um, Android phones, Samsung phones also have facial unlock features. Um, Microsoft Windows has that. Um, so this has definitely become a much more popular way to essentially replace passwords. Um, people are just finding it so difficult to have passwords for so many different websites and whatnot that it's just easier to have one thing and that's your face. Um, of course, there are different ways that facial recognition is being used. I should just point out really quickly, there is um, the apps on your phone or your phone itself to unlock that or to log into something. But then there's also physical security and lot, what they call live facial recognition that's being used um, through cameras. So those are two very different um, use cases. One, surveillance, surveilling crowds of people, and the other, just surveilling a single person on your phone. And I, it reminds me of how far this technology has come because I remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, probably six or seven years ago when Google first introduced some sort of facial recognition into Android. And I can't remember what they called it back then, but it was the easiest thing to fool. Literally all you had to do yeah. was like, you could pull up a, an image of someone's face on another phone and hold it up to the camera and that would let you in. Oh, so wow. it was really just yeah. a demonstration of like, yeah, we can do it, but you don't have absolutely want to rely on it. How robust is this technology now when it comes to authentication, let's say, um, com compared to that? I mean, much more robust, but what are some of the inherent limitations that we're running up against right now? 
Um, so I can't speak for everybody, all these different vendors. There are sure. so many. And I think security experts would say, actually, there's a very, very wide range of, um, you know, how secure these systems are. And kind of near the top are, no surprise, the big players, the likes of Apple. And Apple is extremely secure. I mean, I, I, I actually had a colleague of mine who um, did a 3D printout of his own face and it was a perfect likeness of his face. And he was able to unlock multiple Android phones with it. This was like two years ago, but he couldn't yeah. unlock the iPhone. That was just like impossible. And that is like probably the standard bearer. And that's because it uses hardware, right? They've got these uh, invisible dot projectors that create this depth map of your face and infrared images of the face. And so that working in tandem with the machine learning is what just makes it so difficult to crack. But there are lots and lots of other facial recognition vendors out there um, that uh, are, are not as robust and security experts are concerned about that. Yeah. So how how are these, uh, well, I guess hackers or fraudsters or really, I'm not really quite sure, po potentially, you know, crim criminals, let's say, how, what are they implementing in order to trick some of these systems now, because it's no longer as easy, or at least it shouldn't be as easy as holding up a, a picture of someone's face and getting getting access. There should be a little bit more contextual information. I know that eyes moving is one of them, or also the the depth, like the dots that you're talking about. But how are hackers kind of getting around that? How are they um, getting through those systems? Well, first of all, actually, it's funny you were kind of trying to grasp what to call these people. Are they hackers? And yes. actually, when I when you speak to people who research the security of AI, um, they say it's not really hacking anymore. It's fooling. You are literally, it's almost like you have to use human psychology a little bit to know how to get through these systems because you're not breaking into them. You are trying to perhaps reverse engineer or just understand the algorithms and the models behind these systems so that you can literally trick them. You're literally trying to fool them. Um, and, and yeah, it's, 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 it is happening. Um, there are a lot of research papers out there um, where researchers have managed to fool these systems. Um, and there are real world examples of fraudsters who have managed in the wild to fool these systems to make money. Um, there was an example of this happening in China. This is probably the one involving the most money, but um, over the last couple of years, there was this criminal duo over in Shanghai, um, and they managed to fool the uh, government agency's tax system, which used a facial recognition um, sensor to uh, upload and uh, send out fake invoices to lots of these clients, they had set up this fake shell company. It was an extremely elaborate scheme, but they were basically able to net something like $70 million out of doing this. Oh. Um, and they fooled the system with deep fakes. So they created these um, computer generated videos of people's, um, basically they had the image of someone and then they used AI to make it look like the person was nodding up and down or moving their face left to right in order to fool the system that is looking out for what's known as liveness, liveness detection. And so that was how they they managed to do that. Of course, they got caught. Um, there are much more rudimentary ways to defeat so-called liveness detection. Um, another security expert I spoke to said that, and he literally has done this, um, take a printout of someone else's face and cut the eyes out and then put that print out in front of your face so that your real eyes are looking through the holes into a camera or facial recognition um, system. And uh, and because it's looking for liveness detection, then it can break that system. He, he didn't want to say which systems he was breaking, but there were multiple ones that he was able to break by doing that. That is fascinating. Um, that that really sounds like something that shouldn't work. But then, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. these, how how are these systems supposed to know that that is a that is a cutout with actual eyes and a, and a fake face? Uh, it's it's tricky enough. I think what's really fascinating to me is the is kind of the deep fake aspect of this because I've seen a lot of the demonstrations where someone sets up the system so that they're sitting in front of a computer and then it shows the output and it's like Barack Obama or something and you kind of see yeah. the side by side and that could be I mean. 
mean, we're at a point right now with deep fake technology where things are looking pretty convincing. You can still, if you look closely yeah. enough, kind of decipher where it breaks down. But if that's now, like five years from now, if we're still relying mm -hmm. on facial t recognition systems, it's almost like the in tandem, the uh, the hackers or the foolers, as you said, uh, are working, you know, to to better the technology to break the systems, and the people creating the facial recognition systems are bettering the technology to still be able to detect those fakeries. Um, it's yeah. just an arms race, it seems like, as that as far as that's concerned. Hundred percent, and I think actually one of the things that makes that issue really challenging is actually goes back to why, um, to the controversy around facial recognition. So as you know, right. it's a very controversial technology. And one result of that is that the big, very well-funded tech companies are not really in that business so much anymore. So Google, um, not long ago, pulled out of selling facial recognition, doing facial recognition as a business. Amazon has reined in um, selling it to police departments. Um, and Microsoft also has said they don't really want to be involved with this as a business right now. Um, and with those big companies not selling for this market, it's, it's a big gap that's been left uh, filled by a whole array of smaller companies. And I think that's why there are a lot of security issues because there's just so many kind of unknown names with funny kind of startup names that, and it's, I think, very hard for clients to know which vendors actually have technology that works and which is robust and and which do not. Yeah, and I feel like it's somewhere along the line, I, I don't know, in the last couple of years I heard or, or saw examples of patterns that when flashed on, on into certain recognition systems actually break the system. Is that a part of this as well? Or, I mean, how, how useful or how, um, yeah, how useful is something like that? That I've yes, so that is definitely a thing that researchers have done. I have not seen any evidence of people using that method in the wild to dupe a system. Right now, yeah. the actual methods to to you know fraudulently get past a system are still just to wear masks or to use deep fakes or to show some other face. But this thing of what what they call wearing a so-called adversarial example is um, is still in the research domain, but. What they can do, for example, is um, one researcher was telling me he put on a pair of glasses with this special pattern on them. And the pattern was designed in such a way as to scramble the algorithms that were being used in the facial recognition system that he was looking at through the camera. And because he just calibrated it just right, the system thought that he was Elon Musk. And um, <laughs> he tried it with something right. else, like a, a Band-Aid or a, a special hat, and it thought he was J.K. Rowling. And he was able to trick these systems into thinking he was um, certain celebrities. So you can imagine, um, you know, as these kinds of systems are being used in uh, for access control, it, I was just reading the other day that there's these um, hotel chains in Spain that want to start um, using um, facial recognition instead of room keys. So you can literally get into your hotel room with your face. Oh but just imagine somebody else knows how to you know, get those special glasses or whatever and pretend to be you and they can get in. I mean, this is all speculative, but th these are the kinds of things that some of these uh, security researchers are um, are concerned about. Because guaranteed, if the researchers are concerned about it, uh, the, the people who are looking to fool these systems, they've already thought about it. Uh, they're thinking about all the, the many ways, you know, if you put a facial recognition system on a, a stream of hotel rooms, guaranteed there are going to be people that realize, wait a minute, if I could trick that system, there's probably a lot that can be gained from gaining access to those rooms. So someone's going to a hotel room. It. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Uh, well, Parmi, I really appreciate you coming on uh, and joining us once again to, to kind of talk about your work and especially this piece. I find this topic very fascinating and uh, multifaceted and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Parmi Olson writes for Wall Street Journal, WSJ.com. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Parmi. All righty. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. All right. Coming up, your next job could be because of TikTok.
because maybe you're going to put your resume up there. Actually, it's not that far-fetched. We're going to talk about that uh, in a moment. Or your next job could be because of today's sponsor. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. If you're a business owner who happens to be hiring, you probably have faced a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to finding the right person for the right role, especially in the past year. A lot more challenges probably in the past year. Whether it's not enough applicants with the right skills to, uh, you know, the right skills or the right experience for the position that you have. Maybe you have too many resumes. That can be a big challenge. You have to sort through all of those, but you need to hire right now. It's going to take a whole lot of time and and attention. Uh, Not knowing where to post your job so that you're reaching the right people. That's why hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack and nobody enjoys that. So sure, you can post your job to some job board But then all you can do is hope that the right person kind of comes along and discovers it and kind of trips over it in the process, which is why you should actually try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNW. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, they have matching technology that actually finds people with the right experience for your job. So their technology is going to find that right person and then actively invite them to apply for your job. So there's no more guessing. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So talk about reducing time. There you go. It's no wonder uh, over 2.3 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. So while other companies overwhelm you with way too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you the needle in the haystack. You don't have to find that needle yourself. ZipRecruiter does it for you. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNW. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNW. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Weekly. All right, Micah, over to you. Yes, yes, yes. So um, an interesting story popped up, uh, I think it was just yesterday, I I saw it fly by, uh, about TikTok and uh, some potential uses for it outside of learning, you know, the latest new dance or uh, figuring out, you know, what's replacing the, uh, the, the, what is it, chubby bunny challenge. Um, And this one was kind of not where, not what I expected it to be. Uh, so I immediately said, oh boy, I know who we've got to have on the show today. Uh, joining us, it is my absolute pleasure to say, Abrar Alhiti from CNET is here to talk to us about TikTok. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being your TikTok uh, go-to person. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's let's kick things off here with um, kind of an explanation of uh, this new feature that uh, TikTok is trying out before we kind of get into, because as I, I mentioned to you and in inviting you to the show, I think this on its own maybe is not um, a super in-depth story, but it's kind of the the thoughts surrounding it and the impact of it. So we've got to start with explaining what's going on, what TikTok is experimenting with uh, before we get into the, the bigger impact here. Absolutely. So TikTok is launching this pilot program called TikTok Resumes. And so they, as you said, not only want you to pick up the newest dances and, and find out about the latest products um, that people are talking about, but they want you to find a job. And so they want people to go to TikTok, use a hashtag TikTok Resumes and have companies spot them or find companies that are looking to hire new people employees. And what they want you to do is essentially they want you to show your personality through these videos. So they want to, you know, they don't just want you to turn in a resume and not have companies know what you're like or what your interests are or what you're passionate about. They want you to show companies. And there is such a wide range of companies here. There's Target, Shopify, Chipotle, um, Abercrombie and Fitch. I noticed even TikTok has job postings on this. And so essentially it's a website that you go to and you can see all these listings. But what you do is you create create your TikTok video, and then you drop in a link for your TikTok video, which has your elevator pitch, and you just apply to whatever company you want to apply to, ranging from entry level all the way to expert. Okay, so see, this is what's interesting about this, because I think when people would hear about this right off the bat, um, there's there's like, there's so much here, because we've got to think about how um, you've humans by default are just uh, incredibly resistant to change. And um, due to, you know, any level of, of um, 
you know, unknown uh, and the fear that comes with that are also resistant to kind of the world changing while they stay the same. And so I think immediately you're going to have folks going, okay, uh, this doesn't make sense. It's not how you do resume. Is It's not how you apply for a job. It's back in my day, this is how we applied. <laughs> you got one sheet and if you had more than one, it got thrown in the trash and all mm-hmm. of that. So I, I find it interesting, you've pointed out there that it's not just that you can you know, send out your, your TikTok video, your, you know, your resume or your uh, application in that way. But it's companies actually kind of going to this portal and saying, we are interested in looking at this. Um, so is it, is it a part in what you've seen, is it a particular type of company uh, that seems to be uh, into this? Or did any of the companies that are on the list kind of surprise you? Yeah, you know, it was such a wide range of of companies. I mean, one of the things that's, that I thought was really cool was I saw a listing for an all recipes on camera host and producer. And so it's like, what better way to find if someone's a good fit for that role than to see them in a TikTok video and see what they're like on camera and see how comfortable they are. So when I see roles like that, I'm like, well, that really makes sense for something like this because you can't pick up on that when you turn in, you know, an online resume um, that's just written. And so, you know, I think think it's really cool that it really does range from you have retail and then you have all the way up to like, you know, executives at at various tech companies or, um, you know, like on camera stuff like this, there was listings for like NASCAR and people in sales. I mean, it's stuff that doesn't just relate to, you know, being on camera. But I think I think when people see what you're like and they see your energy, that becomes a really important indicator because, um, you know, someone could have the skills, but if they don't fit into your company culture, we hear a lot about company culture. Um you know, you can teach people skills, but you can't teach mm-hmm. people how to get along with everyone and how to fit in at the company. So I'm thinking that this is really going to be helpful um, for a lot of people. And yeah, it can be hard to get over that. Okay, this is weird. Like, why would a one minute video be something that I use to determine who to hire? But I think there's there's a lot of benefit here. So if you can get over that um, that mental obstacle, I think you can recognize a lot of the potential here. Yeah. And in fact, I um, a friend of mine was uh, applying recently using kind of more traditional means. And I didn't know that uh, in modern times, there are like, you can you call in for a phone interview, for example, and it's like a pre recorded thing where they, they read off the question, and then you respond. And then the person who's uh, hiring will get the recording of your responses to the different questions that you put in. And so it seems like, you know, this tech is already, uh, in some ways, part of the hiring process. And and this helps in some ways to automate it. I do wonder, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, your take on this. Um, there are, especially in the United States, certain laws, regulations, et cetera, around uh, bias and hiring and making sure that, um, you know, certain isms don't play into the hiring practice. Um, do you think that uh, w- with TikTok video with you, you know, going in with video, how do you think that impacts or or uh, plays a role in the concerns that folks might have about hiring? I have been thinking a lot about that because you hear a lot of terrible stories of people, you know, disqualifying candidates because they have names that sound too ethnic. And so mm-hmm. this kind of takes that to the next level because it's like, here's what I look like. Do you like, you know, you'd like to think that hopefully people aren't that biased, but they are. I mean, that's the reality of it. And so, um, you know, there that is a really important consideration. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that these companies that are taking part in this are more forward thinking and um, wouldn't let something like that uh, be an obstacle. But I mean, you think about even with with AI being biased, right? And so, mm-hmm. you know, we're still trying to overcome that no matter what technology we roll out. And um, AI is increasingly being used in the recruitment process and in the hiring process, and you still see issues there. Um, but then I guess you, you, you look on the, you try to look on the bright side here. Okay, well, how can we use technology to our advantage? And how can we, um, what's the good here? And I think the good here is that, um, you know, you do get to see, I mean, we're all on our phones, 
a lot more often now. I, I saw this um, Glassdoor report that said around almost 80% of millennials use their phones to apply for jobs. And, you know, Gen, you know, Gen X is at 73% and baby boomers are at 57. So like with each generation, just imagine what Gen Z is going to be like. Wow. And so we're, we're all on our phones anyway. So why not use these technologies um, to, you know, help companies find people and to help em- help employers find places where they would like to work? Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see I mean, I'm hoping the good trumps the bad here. Right, right. Absolutely. Now, let's uh, so, you know, a, a hypothetical um, LinkedIn uh, comes out with a tool to let you, uh, you know, attach a video to a job application Um versus TikTok doing this. Um, you, well, we've had you on before to talk about TikTok in general. And one of the things that you talk about is authenticity on the platform and how it seems that those videos that feel more authentic, feel more um, in the moment, feel more uh, a connection between you and you know the, the person that's on the camera, um, that that's something unique to TikTok or nearly unique to TikTok. Do you think that uh, there is a difference between TikTok doing this versus a company like uh, LinkedIn doing this. Is there is there something more likely for folks to you know want to use TikTok for this versus LinkedIn, or do you think it's just a generational thing? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, do you remember those memes where it's like, here's my persona on Facebook, here's my persona on LinkedIn, here's my persona <laughs> on whatever. So I think about that, you know, I think about the fact that on TikTok, a lot of people aren't as polished, whereas on LinkedIn, we're all our most professional selves. And, you know, we obviously want to put our best foot forward so companies see, you know, how good we can be um, if if we worked for them. But on TikTok, you get these these very unfiltered views into people's lives. And I think you, you really get that there more than anywhere else. So, um, you know, I think the advantage there... It also be a disadvantage depending on the type Mm -hmm. of content that you upload because it's very easy for employers if your videos are public to see what else you've posted okay here's your really good resume what else have you shared on this platform um so i think you know it gives a more honest view on what somebody is like um versus you know the more polished image that a lot of us have on linkedin but i think that can be a huge advantage i think especially for companies that are open to um people who might not be like cookie cutter like corporate employees i think it'll be it'll be an interesting um, take to look at what people are uploading there. Yeah, I think uh, if I if I were to go from the hiring perspective side of things, I'm you know interviewing some candidates, and I use this as a tool to do so, and I can go and look at their videos, and you know especially in creative roles and and uh, you know whatever role that might be, being able to see the other content that they put out and better understanding a person because of that versus one sheet of paper uh, or one sheet of PDF. Um, to actually get a grasp of who this person is and then have that tied to their more authentic, more authentic life is really interesting. Um, I, I'm curious kind of your thoughts on, so it used to be the, the way I, I, a long time ago before I got into journalism, um, I was very into graphic design and uh, was planning on going into graphic design as a career. And so I spent a lot of time uh, sort of, you know, looking all over the internet at uh, graphic design resumes and seeing these beautifully designed resumes and ones that stood out in different ways. Uh, And now we've got this new way of doing it with video. Um, So I'm kind of curious your thoughts on the, the, the way to stand out uh, when it comes to all of these other people who are applying for jobs, uh, do you kind of feel that uh, video, especially this kind, gives you potentially gives you a leg up uh, over the competition? I think one of the really cool things about TikTok is that people, um, you know, will often, even if they're not trying to go viral, they're just posting something that they're really passionate about. Here's this, here's something that I made, here's something that I do. And then it it gets a lot of attention and then other opportunities come from there. I think there really is huge potential here because, you know, because of the algorithm and because of the ability for everyday people to go viral oftentimes more easily than on other platforms. I think this is a really cool way to showcase your talents. There was even, you know, on the FAQ for this TikTok resumes feature, it said, what if I'm not necessarily looking for a job? And TikTok said, you know, you should still post something because someone, it still might catch somebody's eye. And so I think if you do something that really stands 
stands out, if you do something that um, people connect with. And because of, again, because of the algorithm, it'll often show up on people's pages who, um, it's a creepy algorithm, but it's honestly so spot on. It'll show up in front of the right people, you know, more often than not. And so, um, I think there's just so much potential there that if there is something that you're passionate about, if there is something that you've created that you'd love to show off, my personally, my go-to place would be to post it on TikTok because I think it's more likely to catch more eyes. Um, and so it is interesting to see how, you know, I, I, there was this other within the TikTok resumes hashtag, it shows people who have, you know, who have career tips or have their own experiences. And one girl I saw, she posted that she had been posting on TikTok. TikTok reached out to her. She now works for TikTok and she now oh, has wow. like collaborations with brands. Like that's just something she just posted a video and it became this whole thing. And so now she has, you know, like several thousand followers and works for this company. So you really never know where it's going to take you. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, I, I I just think this is is fascinating, especially as kind of a, a democratizing tool in a way, um, because, you know, looking at a piece of paper again at a, at a page, uh, a PDF page, there may not be uh, a level of of understanding who a person is, and someone may not be as good at putting in words uh, on a page what and who they are. And when we think about, uh, you know, depending on the job, I mean, if, if they're if you're applying for a copy editor gig, then yes, <laughs> we we want to make sure that that uh, resume has no typos and things like that. But if the job is a creative job or it's a job where it's not going to involve a lot of of writing or uh, you know a really in depth kind of detail work that you need to have everything exactly right. Um, it could be beneficial for everybody to see someone in a different way. Uh, and for things to stand out too, I think that it's, it's an opportunity for people to stand out. So uh, I, I just found this really fascinating and it'll be interesting to see what other companies uh, might consider doing this or using this tool. So we'll have to keep an eye on that list to see what other companies end up kind of uh, putting their hat in the ring, so to speak, on um, joining the TikTok resume uh, section. Uh, Abrar Alhiti, I want to thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this feature and to talk about kind of the larger scope of uh, new ways of applying for jobs. Of course, folks can head to CNET uh, to check out your great work. But if they want to follow you online, where would they go to do so? You can follow me on Twitter at Alhiti underscore three. And hey, if you want to follow me on TikTok, it's just my first and last name. I don't have a resume on there, but you know, <laughs> there's other good stuff. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. Uh, that takes care of that. Up next, we've got Jason Howell's story of the week. Jason Howell, what is your story of the week? Hmm. Well, I opened t uh, t uh, Tech Meme. It's, it's been a week and a <laughs> half TikTok? since I've been gone. <laughs> yes, I know. I didn't open TikTok because then I'd spend an hour watching and flipping. Uh, instead, I opened Tech Meme because I was here to work. And what I found was a story that uh, I know is very familiar to folks who watch and listen to this show. Very familiar to you, Micah, uh, because we've, we've talked about this many times. We talked about the Epic versus Apple kind of battle. Uh, it turns out that was only the beginning. You know, it wasn't always just Epic versus Apple. It was also Epic versus Google. Uh, but Epic versus Apple has been the thing that's really caught a lot of attention. And now Google is facing another App Store reckoning kind of in the shadow or maybe creating its own shadow over the Epic case. 36 states along with the District of Columbia, sued Google yesterday on antitrust grounds related to its control of the Google Play Store. And so very similar to what Apple had, had done for so many years, Google had a 30% commission fee of apps sold through the store. That's highlighted in the suit. Google allegedly, you know, by the suit, overcharges developers via the Play Store. Of course, Google has adjusted its fees uh, in recent months down to 15%, uh, but that's tied to, you know, the first million in annual sales by a, by a particular developer. So that could jump up after that time, depending on the amount of sales and all that. Uh, Epic Games, like I said, sued Google for similar reasons uh, just last year. Um, and then, you know, everybody has, has been kind of watching how Epic versus Apple has kind of 
kind of laid its footprint on Apple's approach to its App Store. Apple's made some changes to the App Store kind of in the in light of of uh, the things going on there. And in this case, you've got a lawsuit brought by state attorneys general, which I mean, I would imagine has a little bit more bite as a result. We'll certainly see how it all plays out. Um, but I think what's interesting here is the, is kind of contrasting the differences between what Apple offers on uh, iPhones and iOS devices and what Google offers on Android. There's a lot mm -hmm. of similarities, but there are some differences. Google actually points this out. They, they posted a blog post uh, where they where they you know highlight the fact that Android is more open than the others. You know I don't know that they necessarily name Apple, but you know who they're talking about when they say the others uh, when it comes to app distribution. In the case of of Android uh, devices, APK files are, are have long have since almost the beginning have been the install files, uh, and those can be offered by developers on their own sites. As one example, if I'm a developer for Android, I could always have my app on the Play Store and then also have my website, you know, and, and let people come to the website and download the APK and install it immediately. Oh. There, are, there are no real barriers to do that, that Google puts up in, in front of that. Um, Epic Games, of course, did this with Fortnite before they finally um, decided to to bring um, Fortnite into the Play Store. They did that for like a year, year and a half, I think. Um, it does require users to flip a switch on their Android device that lessens the security model in order to do that. Because it's basically you're installing an app that hasn't been cleared by, you know what I mean? Right. Through, There's through, been no uh, review of it other than exactly. the review that is claimed by that developer. Totally. But although at the same time, Google does have um, does have software in including on the Play Store that scans the device and and the apps that are installed, whether they're through the Play Store or not, to see if they match anything in their own database. So if there is something that matches, it would give you a warning message. So there are some protections, but but in essence, Android users have a choice to install outside of the Play Store. The Play Store isn't the only place that they can go. Um, Google also notes that many Android devices are shipping with multiple app stores. And I didn't really think about this, but it's true. If you've got a Samsung device, you get the Play Store. You also get the Galaxy Store. And they're both on the device. They both carry some similar apps. Obviously, the Play Store is way more robust than Samsung's Galaxy Store. But it is an alternative, and it ships on the device. Samsung uh, devices are arguably the most popular, most widespread, at least here in the U.S., uh, Android maker uh, of, of devices. So you're going to find that that dual app store thing on many of the devices that you buy in the U.S. Apple users, to my knowledge, don't have a similar choice as far as that's concerned. But, right. Um, Anyways, what, what do you think about this so far? Where, where are your See, thoughts? the frustrating thing about this that continues to be so frustrating about this is time and time again, we are shown that the folks doing these things, the folks that are claiming these things, that are uh, arguing these points, don't have a full grasp of the situation. And in some cases have hardly any grasp of the situation and any understanding of the situation. Because... Yes, to just lump all of these companies together and say they're all doing the same thing and that it's all bad and that, you know, it all needs to be fixed, then Google needs to come out with this thing, this, you know, long post and whatever else they're doing. I'm sure increasing lobbying, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's like it's just it's it's so much talking to uh, that monkey emoji that has its uh, its hands <laughs> yeah. over its ears like the lawmakers that are um, concerned about this, they, sorry, I'm getting really frustrated because it's reminding me of too many situations where um, folks in some level of power uh, make an assumption about you or about another person or about a situation and they make that assumption without the full understanding and then they just stick to that assumption and mm -hmm. then they close off your their ears and no matter what you tell them and how many times you try to explain it to them or try to uh show why it's not the assumption that they made they've already made their assumption and they're sticking to it and that's what this feels like and it's like it's like it's almost too late uh in many ways and you they just have gone you know what this is this and that's that so let's keep going and 
luckily in the case of of like if if we have to work in the bounds of what we have then it's lucky i guess that lobbying to some extent does work um in an ideal world you we wouldn't have that but let's work in the world that we have which is far from ideal uh it's lucky that that lobbying works in a way that it can sort of uh peel back those those hands a little bit and I just, the thing that frustrates me is like at the root of it, we've got human beings who are flawed as we, like we're all flawed and you know, that they only have so much time in a given day and they have their own concerns and worries and issues and, and, uh, beliefs and all these things. And so if they don't want to sit down and listen to someone go on about, you know, how the, how this particular app store works, like they're not developers they're not um you know they're, they're not paid by google to uh spend all day uh you know reviewing apps it's like we expect this group of people to have expertise in every living thing yeah, and right. when and they don't and we know they don't and so what we expect instead is that they listen to and trust the experts in these different fields of expertise but the fact is they don't always listen to and trust the people in these different fields of expertise. And then it results in things like this. Like very clearly, um, Google and Apple should not be lumped into the same situation here because very clearly, Google is a more open platform. And it's like Apple has never... Uh, tried to lump the two together because Apple mm-hmm. has always set itself apart from Google by saying that it is a more safe and secure platform by being more locked down and has used, yeah, right. you know, the Google Play Store as an example of um, why Apple why Apple feels its system is more secure, yada, yada, yada. So the, you know, the big companies that are involved in this, they're in agreement on the fact that the two are different. And the... The the people in those places are, but then it's frustrating that the people who are responsible for making these decisions, it's like for us, we can very clearly see when we look at something like this, that they don't have any idea what they're talking about. And that's what gets so frustrating about it. I think if, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be curious to hear what Jeff Jarvis on This Week in Google says next week, but I imagine this is one of those, you know, t- uh, the moral panic or something along those lines, um, just in the sense of the anti-big tech sentiment, which is a huge deal right now, and it's driving a lot of this pursuit of antitrust, which, you know, antitrust charges, which I'm not even saying that they're they're right or wrong to do so. Uh, obviously, right. there's, some, there's a there there because it's happening in the EU. It's happening in the US. Uh, there are a lot of people who are increasingly more and more concerned with overreach and everything on the hands of uh, big tech. But this this particular example, to a certain degree, for me, feels kind of like, all right, this is like... This this is lumped in with that, and I don't know that they're necessarily the same thing. Maybe maybe Google is culpable to a certain degree for something in here, some you know somewhat, but saying that they're not competitive, um, <laughs> or or not not allowing com- competition is just I think to, by many degrees false. Uh, it's wholly com- inaccurate. Com- absolutely, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's uh, absolutely false. And there was um there's a report that. So Facebook funded it because Facebook is pretty much mad at Apple for uh, its desire to protect user privacy um, with its new tools to prevent uh, app tracking. And so it's got an app tracking transparency tool that uh, released um, as part of iOS 14 and uh, continues to be improved in iOS 15, which will come out later this fall. And Facebook was very upset about this in the beginning. Then they published, you know, uh, pieces in the New York Times and, uh, you know, put out all these different things. And now it's like Facebook is doing everything it can to fight Apple on every front because of the app tracking transparency thing. And so uh, Facebook uh, helped fund a Comcast, or not Comcast, but Comscore study about people who uh, download apps in the Google Play Store and in Apple's App Store. Um, And it looked at 
how often people use apps other than the default apps that come with the system in an attempt to argue that it reduced, you know, the, the, uh, competition because the default apps were available. Um, Apple of course said, and, and I say, of course, not because it's necessarily true or not true, but of course, because of course they're going to respond, uh, to say that there were lots of problems with the study. Um, but what the study showed was like, I think it was 87% of people just stick with the default apps yep. and the, I just, <laughs> once again, I'm frustrated because I think about the average person who, when they are thinking about getting a smartphone or a, a tablet or something like that, they want to, they, they don't think of it in terms of like the average person does not think about it in terms of, um, I want my airmail and my, um, my, I don't know, Android messages and my, uh, carrot weather and my pocket casts and my, vi they're not thinking about it in terms of app names. They're thinking about it in terms of activity and, and, uh, yeah, you know, that's a good point. And, and tasks that they need to complete. And so you mm -hmm. give them a tool that doesn't have any of that and they've got to go out and look for it themselves. And suddenly they're, you know, they, they go and they find the first thing that's in the app store that may be, you know, free. And it may not be a good thing. It may not be something that would, you know, that they should be plugging their email into. And there's some level of like comfort that you can have with the default apps uh, f that are provided by the vendor uh, to know that, you know, those systems are, have a little more attention paid to them or are a little more secure, whatever it happens to be. And to like make things more inconvenient for the end user for the sake of, of competition and for people who are listening, I'm doing a, like billion scare quotes here. That's where I get frustrated as well. As a person who, for a living, tries to help people with technology, that's where, I, you know, that, that there's more frustration there. It's like, so we should just not do default apps at all. So when you get a phone, do you it's like not, a blank slate. like, how do you listen to music? Um, how do you, somebody, somebody took it a little bit to the extreme. They're like, you get a phone, it's just got a black screen. You've got to figure out how to set up a TCP IP connection. You've right, got to figure right. out how to install a browser on it. Um, like I want people to be able to do the activities that they expect out of their devices. And it's like, there are some folks who are bent out of shape, um, about retributive at yeah, retributive action that's taken place who are leading this charge and then people who are going to actually be impacted not even knowing the full scope of the situation or how this will impact them and how it could negatively impact them and positively impact them. And yeah, I, I guess what it boils down to is I think that antitrust is very important and that uh, there are some things, you know, I want the app store to be a place where every developer can thrive. Uh, and uh, Apple is not allowed to like promote its apps over other apps or, you know, pop up like an Apple Music uh, notification for, hey, you should get Apple Music or those kinds of things where everybody gets equal mm -hmm. um, access in that way. But I don't want it to get to the point where it's just this blanket, like, let's just make these devices not work until someone figures out how to go in and do all of the downloading and stuff. Because if that's the case, then what I'm going to end up doing whenever, because people are going to do a Google search and they're going to look for, you know, how do I get mail on my phone? I'm mm -hmm. going to be on iOS today talking about how you download the default apps from Apple because those ones are the easiest ones to use. You'll probably be talking about using Gmail because that, you know, a lot of people use Gmail accounts. That's and so it's is, easiest yeah. to just use a Gmail app or what have you. So yeah, that's like, it's, I'm not complaining solely because it's giving me more work, but I'm complaining because of how it has the potential to inconvenience and, at the end of the day, harm the end consumer instead of helping, which is what the whole point of all of this stuff is supposed to be, is to help the consumer and make it better for the consumer. And it's like, are we trying to make things better for the consumer or are we trying to win 
in this war against big tech as yeah. lawmakers? Is it like you just want to win one? I don't know. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. Are you trying to improve the the actual user experience at the end of the day or are you just grinding an axe? You know? <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. And yeah. if you are, no, why, like why – Think about the impact of what you're doing, which I know is hard for lawmakers. You know, they, then, you know, it's, it becomes it's a very... snowball. It becomes a snowball and everybody starts packing onto that snowball. And, you know, and at, at a certain point, it, it just gets too big to control. It's like, oh, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And yeah, you're right. It just, it balloons to the size and to the scope that um, ends up being exactly the opposite of what it began as. Um, yeah, I don't know. No, no easy answers, obviously. And, you know, a part of it is, like you said, a part of it is a misunderstanding of the technology on the other side. It's it's um, yeah, it's pretty multifaceted, but uh, interesting nonetheless uh, to see what happens here. I can't help but just kind of feel like this is just a, a, a settle like a settlement cash grab of some sort. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, it feels very much like that, but I'll be curious to see how it develops. All right. And coming up, Micah's story of the week. All right. What you got, Micah? Yeah. So, um, this was a piece that I, I saw, I think yesterday, uh, Bloomberg, uh, Jason Schreier had shared this story about uh, Ubisoft um, working on Assassin's Creed Live. So um, this starts with a little explanation. I have always said I was, you know, I'm not a gamer. I don't really play games and haven't, you know, in in quite a while uh, found any interest in playing games. But I, um, not too terribly long ago uh, for iOS Today, was showing off some apps that can take advantage of the the newest iPad. So these were uh, high performance apps and games that were available. And one of those was Divinity Original Sin 2. Um, and I ended up playing that game and like playing it to the end and beating it and realized how much fun it was. And so from there, I kind of looked around to try and find other ones. And Assassin's Creed Valhalla uh, came around and I have been playing that. And this is a huge game. So I, you know, hardly anywhere through it. Uh, but it had me thinking like, what happens when I beat this game and it is over? You know, even though it's a huge world and that they do add some patches from time to time. Eventually, it's going to run out and it will be over. And then I was uh, thinking to Leo uh, has until because Valhalla is still not Valhalla. Valheim um, is still in early access. And so it's not, you know, fully 100 percent done. And so as it stands, he has beat the game for the content that's available. And then later they'll release more and then he'll be able to beat that. But he was kind of lamenting too. Like, what do I do now? All I can do is go around and farm and cook. Uh, but I want more. I want to be able to continue to play. And so this story that popped up made me go, made me think interesting uh, because uh, games like uh, Grand Theft Auto V and Fortnite, um, which are kind of these, these more open world, continually updated games, it could very well be the way of things uh, going forward. Ubisoft's next Assassin's Creed game is this live online uh, situation where you would be able to kind of play a massive online platform that over time evolves and that the developers can continue working on it. And what I find interesting is the way that uh, I think Steam and the, the Steam store has kind of helped lead the charge in this because there are quite a few games that do this quote unquote, early access thing where they release the game kind of in chunks and they say, you know, you know, this is early, this is beta, you might run into bugs, but you kind of get to help test the game. And that's part of it, yes, but it also feels almost like a chapter book, uh, but the chapters keep coming. And for some games, it will eventually get to the end. And so you kind of are going along with it and you end up beating it. But I think that the way that, you know, the, the networking has changed so that we are all online, like the way that I play Valhalla, I don't have a console that could play Valhalla. What I do is use um, the Amazon Luna system. And I, so that way I can play it on the iPad or on my Mac or even on my iPhone if I wanted to. It connects to a virtual machine that runs Valhalla and then I'm able to play it through that. Um, 
And so given these game streaming services uh, where you are streaming basically just the video uh, of the game and the game's kind of running on a, a, a server somewhere else and the way that we have connection in so many places, I'm not surprised that this is the way that things are going. And I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to see games uh, do this where because I don't know about you, but it's like I come to the end of an audio book and if it's the end of a, a whole series, then I'm like, oh, man, I've got to find, you know, a new series to really get into, really get going. And you almost wish that the story would keep going and going and going and going. And this is one of those ways that things can keep going and going and going. But I'm curious, do you prefer the game that's like a traditional chapter book where at the end you get to put it away and say, I've done this? Or do you like the idea of getting to continue to immerse yourself in a world uh, and keep going with the understanding that, you know, there's kind of no true end to what you're doing and that it's just a continuous um, adventure. I think if I was a bigger gamer than I am, which um, on a scale of one to 10, I'm probably like a two, <laughs> which is to say, which is not to say that I don't play games. Ever. Like I have a PS4, I have a number of games um, that, you know, I will, I will drop into every once in a while and, and check out. And sometimes I'll, I'll even complete a game. But I think if I was a bigger gamer, like it was more of like a regular thing that I had in my life all the time instead of these little moments where they fill in, uh, you know, at, at certain times for whatever reason, um, then I might prefer the ongoing experience. But being that I am so infrequent with my gaming, yeah, I like to have an end. And I like to know that, like, I can I can finally, like, pull that, you know, remove that. I mean, if it's a digital, you know, fi remove it from the device or mm -hmm. pop out the, the Blu-ray and, like, put it into the case and be like, I've done that. It's done. It's almost like proof to me that like, okay, I can still game because I completed that one, you know, <laughs> as opposed right. to a game that goes forever. And it's like, I would, I know myself well enough, at least at the point that I'm at right now, that if a game truly goes forever and there is no end point, like I would, I would tire of that at a certain point. And, um, I don't know, maybe if I was a bigger, uh, a bigger gamer, bigger into into gaming that wouldn't bother me as much but i do like having an end to my games for sure yep i um i i can understand you kind of you know both sides of that uh for sure and you know, i think that there's obviously uh, a long history of games that are these MMORPGs uh, for anybody who's not into gaming at all or doesn't it's massively multiplayer online yeah. role playing games um and they tend to give up some level of graphics quality for the sake of uh, having kind of more uh, more play, longer play, no real. Um, but but that, that's that's the trade off. But what yeah. I what I'm interested in and what I'm curious about is like Assassin, Assassin's Creed has traditionally been a really story driven um uh, brand, I guess. I, I don't know what else, uh, other word to use. Um, and IP, that's the word, uh, a really story driven IP and has focused on these kind of, uh, chapters. And so with that, um, I wonder how this kind of online system would affect that because I think that part of what makes this uh, this this IP so great is the fact that it uh, tells such a great story as you're playing along. And do you lose that when it's a game that keeps going and going? Um, or are folks okay with losing that? And if so, will Ubisoft um, also make additions to the series? Uh, aside from the online game that ends up existing. Uh, so all of those questions, you know, are, are ones that I think folks will want to have answers to. But ultimately, all this is to say, it's been really interesting watching the way that this content um, is shaped by uh, the cloud computing and um, online everywhere 
and 5G and all of those things that are coming together to uh, bring internet to more places and bring faster internet to more places, um, particularly for those of us in some level of, of, of a privileged situation where, you know, we can be in our homes and or at our workplace and have access to fast uh, internet in those places with devices that support, you know, faster levels of internet. So, yeah, that's the thing that's interesting to see how that's shaping the game industry yeah. and how uh, these different game developers are working to kind of um, to to adapt to fit that uh, new way of doing things. Yeah, indeed. Well, on services like Luna and Stadia, um, I'm I'm definitely curious that you've been using Luna. So I'm, I would love to check out Luna and see how it compares to Stadia at some point. But just this idea that we can, if if you have the internet connection that supports it, you can really be anywhere and playing kind of AAA games from a from a current console. You know, that's just that's just the sort of thing that like not very long ago didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, how do you even right. didn't seem possible. Now, now it is. So, yeah. 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 Cool Pretty stuff. Cool. All right. Well, we have reached the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening. We do the show every Thursday. So if you go to twit.tv slash TNW, you'll find all the things you need to know about this show uh, to subscribe, uh, find it in audio and video formats, however you prefer. Jump out to YouTube. It's all there. Twit.tv slash TNW. By the way, if you want all of our shows ad free, there's a way you can do that while also supporting us. You should check out Club Twit. For seven bucks a month, you get access to every Twitch show with no ads. Uh, then you get access to an exclusive Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find other places uh, before and after uh, the show or you know hidden features, etc. As well as access to the members-only Discord server where you can chat with the hosts and producers and other folks here at Twit, but also uh, hang out with all of your other pals that have joined the Club Twit stream or the, the Club Twit server. If that sounds awesome to you, and I think it should, uh, all you got to do is head to twit.tv slash club twit to check it out. Twit.tv slash club twit. Uh, by the way, if you would like to uh, tweet at me or send messages or whatever, uh, you can find me at Micah Sargent on pretty much uh, all the social media networks. Um, and then you should also check out uh, my shows. Later today, I'll be hosting Smart Tech Today with Matthew Casanelli. And tomorrow, I'll be hosting uh, iOS Today with Rosemary Orchard. And in the coming week, we'll be filling in for Leo um, on a couple of shows uh, while he's on vacation. So you can see those as well. Jason, what about you? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Um, yeah, you know, All About Android is the only other show that you're probably going to catch me on this week because I am hitting the road tomorrow with my family. We're going to Oregon or through Oregon uh, camping and enjoying the outdoors for a while. So I'm really looking forward to this vacation. So thank you for um, holding, holding down the fort. Uh, doing everything. Mike. You've, you've got so much on your plate. I can't thank you enough. Thank you for covering uh, while I'm out. Uh, but that is it for this week. Uh, big thanks to uh, to John Ashley at the studio for, for being our TD and editing and turning this around. Uh, Burke, of course, at the studio for making the connections behind the scenes and helping in the studio. And thanks to you for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is, I like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.